welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast, your home for weekly information and inspiration to help you get the graduate job of your dreams. Welcome back everyone to the Graduate Job Podcast with your host, James Curran. The Graduate Job Podcast is your weekly home for all things related to helping you on your journey to finding that amazing job. Each week I bring together the best minds in the industry, speaking to leading authors, entrepreneurs, coaches and bloggers who bring decades of experience into a bite-sized weekly 30-minute show. Put simply, this is a show I wish I had a decade ago when I graduated. This week I speak with Corinne Mills, best-selling author and managing director of personal career management, as we delve into the topic of how to sell yourself effectively on your job hunt. If you're a regular listener and you think the name sounds familiar, you're right. As Corinne's book, You're Hired, How to Write a Brilliant CV, was one of my top tips in episode 14 on seven books every graduate should read. Today, though, we explore how and why you should be proactive in selling yourself, the importance of body language and vocal tonality, and share some great tips on how you can begin to showcase your skills without coming across as arrogant. If you're currently looking for a job, or even if you're in work but looking to progress through the ranks, then this is an episode you're not going to want to miss. As always, links to all we discuss and a full transcript are available in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash sell yourself. But without further ado, let's dive straight in with episode 24. A very warm welcome today to Corinne Mills, best-selling author of Career Coach and You're Hired, How to Write a Brilliant CV, and also the Managing Director of Personal Career Management, the UK's leading career coaching and outplacement company. Corinne, a very warm welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast. Hello, James. Thanks for inviting me on. So before we jump into our topic today of how to sell yourself effectively, uh, would you like to tell us a little bit more about what it is that you do and how you became a career coach, author and MD? Okay. Um, Well, what do I do? I work with people with all kinds of career challenges, uh, from people who aren't quite sure what it is that they want career-wise, or maybe they're in a role and they're not sure that this is totally a good fit, um, to people who know exactly what they want, they just want some help in going out and getting it. And that's all the kind of salesmanship side. Um, I also work with people in jobs, in terms of executive coaching. Uh, so really helping people from careers choices to self-marketing to effective performance in, in the job, um, all the way through. And I do that, um, and I have a team and coaches who do that as well, and I do training workshops. Um, so really, kind of my, my life is consumed with people's career challenges and, and how I can help with that. Excellent. And you mentioned there about self-promotion, and today we're going to talk about how to effectively sell yourself in the recruitment process. I know one of uh, the most common complaints I, I get from people I coach is, I just don't know how to sell myself. So starting at the, the beginning, Corin. Why is it important that people sell themselves effectively? Uh, People need to sell themselves because uh, people who are going to recruit you are likely to be strangers and they're not going to know you and they're not psychic. (laughs) So you have to give them the information they need in order to make a good judgment about whether you're the right person for the job or not. And I think what the opportunity that's missed is that there are lots of very, very talented, capable people out there who don't get the opportunity for the jobs that they want because they can't sell themselves. It's not that they can't do the job, it's that it's a salesmanship piece. And you know, in some respects you'd say, it's not fair. You know, why why should you have to go through this sales process? in order to prove you're the right person uh, for the job. But you know that that's the reality. And recruiters are making such snapshot judgments, rightly or wrongly, you know, it might be 10 seconds on a CV, it might be a 45 minute hour interview, Um, it's an imperfect recruitment process, but in those short windows of time, you are going to have to make an impression if you want that job. And speaking from a a British point of view, um, is this something that as a as a culture, we tend to be quite bad at blowing our own trumpet? Yes, we are. I, to be fair, I think there's quite a few other cultures uh, as well, a culture of modesty. And I think particularly in this, com- in this country, there is a real, you know, when you're in a job, the focus is on team. 
it's we did this, it's a very team orientation, and then suddenly you go into the job market, and if you're talking about achievements, they don't want to know what the team achieved, they want to know what you personally did. So the I pronoun comes in, I did this, I did that, so it can feel quite unnatural for people, but it is, it is a necessary shift in pronoun. So if we start, maybe go through each aspect of the recruitment process. So the CV tends to be the, uh, the CV or application form tends to be the, the first one. How do you recommend people talk about themselves and their achievements in a, in a positive way? You mentioned the, use, the switch to using I, but in a CV that can get quite repetitive if people tend to overuse it. So what would you recommend is uh, one of the best place to, to start with a CV or application? So first of all, before you even put you know, your, your fingers on the keyboard to make your application, you have to do your research. You have to really understand what it is that they are looking for. Um, and too often people make assumptions uh, about what they think the, the recruiter is looking for. So that doesn't just mean looking at the job description, looking at the advert, looking at the person specification, because again, you know, recruiters will tell you exactly what it is they want because they don't want to be swamped with applications from people that are unsuitable. So they're giving you some guidelines there. But additionally, do some research about the company. What kind of company is this? What kind of sector does it operate in? What's going to be its priorities? Is it fast moving? Is it innovative? Is it you're likely to be bureaucratic and systems orientated. So you've got a sense of the whole organisation and the, uh, their modus operandi, if you like, the, the way that they work. And you can pick up an awful lot of that from their website, from PR and press releases that will again will be on one site. And if you can, talk to people who work in that organisation or for them or know of them or the kind of role that you're going for. So before you sit down to make that application, you've got a really rounded, realistic view of what the job entails and what they're looking for. So that's your starting point. Then, your CV and application needs to focus on their priorities. Quite often what people do is they think, well, um, I'll just splurge down on paper all the things that I think are important about me. Actually, you need to kind of change that around. What is most important for them? So you're cherry picking from all the range of things that you can do, the things that they want to hear about. And so it should definitely be that in that order. So it makes it very easy to see in that first 10 seconds or in that first half page of your CV all the stuff that's relevant for them. Now, you made some brilliant points there. And personally, I'm always surprised because for me, it's such an obvious thing is to, is to get the, uh, the job spec and you know, just to go through and just tick off each part and make sure that you've you've covered it off in your in the CV, um, whether it's in the up at the top in the you know key skills or summary or just make sure that it's in there somewhere. Uh, well, uh, absolutely. Um, yes, it, it, one would think it would be obvious, but actually, quite often people miss it. Again, if, if people understand that that person specification form is the recruiter's decision criteria. So, and they literally will be going through and ticking, right, did this person prove that they satisfy this criteria? Tick, great, cross if they've not mentioned it, question mark is equally no good. Um, you have to be very explicit about those things. Uh, sticking with CVs, another common mistake I find is that people just list just uh, list things in, without any backup to um, to back up the, the statements they're making. So I'm hardworking, I'm dedicated, and they just, just list them out without then uh, specifying how they are, those things. Uh, absolutely. You know, you've got to, you, you've got to substantiate any claims that you make. You know, if you talk about yourself being, you know, a, a future leader... <laughs> And all of these, you know, dynamic individual and you know, innovative. But right? well, come on, let's see the proof. Where's the examples of that? And I think you know, people worry about bragging and blowing their own trumpet. But actually, if you satisfy the criteria, perhaps you are incredibly innovative. Um, and you know, for example, I created this, that, and the other, or I initiated this, or one of my ideas for this program. 
was run with and, and adopted by the company, then that's not bragging, that's actually factual evidence. <laughs> Um, that's reality, and, and I think that's definitely where people need to go in providing examples. How would you recommend that people can begin to discover what their strengths are and what they're really good at? I think that's a really interesting question for people more at the start of their career, because sometimes people, what people think they will like and are interested in and think that they are good at, they kind of need to go out and test, because actually they might find that it's something slightly different. Um, so, I, I just think work experience of some sort or another, whether it's paid, unpaid, doesn't matter whether it's relevant to the particular job that you've got in mind. You know, you might want to go work in financial services, but you're going to be a, a, a waiter, and but, but you know, as an interim role. Actually, it's just fantastic experience, and you learn really quickly. Well, actually, I am good at time management. I do really enjoy working with customers, or I hate it. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in the more system side or the sales side of that. So actually, I do think you might already have some ideas from other activities you've been involved in. Maybe you were in a, you know, you helped organise some events when you were at university and you enjoyed that, or you're interested in a particular subject and you want to go and run with that. But I don't think there's anything quite like going and trying some work experience in those fields to work out whether it is compatible with you know, what you want, might want to do in the future. I completely agree, and nothing beats a work experience on a CV as well. Uh, uh, absolutely. I think, interestingly, kind of culturally, what I've noticed in, in some international students, um, there is a tendency to, and kind of culturally it's thought, well, you get all your academics together, you get your results, and then you go out and get your work experience. So everything kind of tends to be put on hold while you get your the best class degree that you can. Actually, it is so important. If you want to work in the UK, <laughs> and actually I think anyway, it's so important to get some work experience while you're a graduate. You know, um, even if you're taking a year off post-grad to go and do some travelling, do some work experience also during that. So you've got some things to talk about to, to a potential employer. No, I completely agree. So moving on from the CV to the next stage, so probably an interview, maybe face-to-face -face interview. What would you recommend for uh, people in terms of how they can make that first impression when they walk in the room? I think they need to look like they want to be there, actually. <laughs> they need to be enthusiastic, smiley. You know, it doesn't matter if they come across as being nervous. Like most people are nervous in interviews, and actually it's a sign that you care about the job, actually. So don't worry about seeming, you know, or not, not showing a shred of nerves. Some nerves is, is fine. I think sometimes people think they need to play it cool, that they shouldn't come across as being too desperate and that yes, this is an opportunity to, you know, find out whether the organisation is, what the organisation can do for them and whether they are right for them, it's a two-way process. Well, you know what, yes, it is a two-way process, but unless you go into that interview looking enthused, motivated, committed, you generally want to be there. Um, you're not going to get the job offer. They're not going to give it to somebody who looks like they really couldn't care whether they want it or not. Um, so I think in terms of making that impact, one, go for jobs that you really want and you're interested in, because there's no point going for jobs that you're not interested in. Um, but actually, you know, let that kind of, that will show in your body language if you're generally interested in the job. It's one of the things that's very difficult to to fake is is that initial enthusiasm of if you are interested in the company and you're interested in the industry and you know it's something that you've got a passion about and you read about it and you you can't fake that and it comes across so well in whether it's a telephone interview or a face-to-face -face interview and people naturally want to work with people who are interested and keen uh, and, and that will be a competitive advantage. Now, I'm not saying that people will give you a job just because you're committed and keen. Right? You have to show you've got the capabilities to do the job as well. 
But actually, if you show you've got the capabilities to do the job and you come out as enthusiastic, that is a competitive edge. And sometimes, and I've seen it lots and lots of times, people who look great on paper get into that interview room, clearly could do the job, but actually they're not very focused, they're a bit cool, they're not going to get the job offer because their ambivalence is kind of translating itself to the interviewer. So we talked then about the enthusiasm. How important is body language for the way that people carry themselves into the, into the room? Body language is really important because actually it just it tells your state of mind. So it's like visual cues that the recruiter is going to pick up on um, that kind of signify what's really going on beneath the surface. So in some respects, you can be giving really great quality answers, um, really well thought through, you know, on the money, but actually if you're delivering it in a kind of tentative way, <laughs> if you're slumped, if you're, while you're doing that, you keep shifting in your chair, is completely going to undermine the content of what you're saying. So the two have to very much go together. Now, I do think it is something that actually people aren't very self-aware of. It is very difficult for you to know how you're coming across at an interview. So I always suggest that people do a mock interview with someone who can, who, who can give some honest feedback about the messages that they are receiving, not just verbally, but those kind of visual cues as well from the body language. And how about tone of voice as well with just the way that people we speak? We talked about people might be a bit shy. How important is, is tone of voice in just how people project themselves? Tone of voice is really, really important. And I think what's kind of interesting sometimes about graduates is that they are still finding their tone of voice in a formal interview situation because it's still a relatively new kind of formal interaction, if you like. Sometimes they're not quite sure of the voice. So, for instance, I've seen candidates who use a, um, either a, a very girly voice or an apprentice type voice. You know, something that they feel acquired, that they feel that actually I need to put this voice or, or to be posher than, than they are. And there's something that's just a little bit of a strain on, on their voice so it doesn't feel authentic. So I think they have to be comfortable with their own voice. Um, don't worry, you know, there's no, there's no, it, actually, there's no issue about people's accents or, or where they come from or how posh they are. It is about most importantly, being authentic, speaking up so that you can be heard, and that self-belief that I think, you know, if people doubt themselves and their tone of voice becomes quite tentative, but actually if they believe in what they're saying, they feel energised and passionate about what they're saying, then their voice, even if they've got a quieter voice, will come across as kind of quietly confident. I think the word that stuck out for me they used was authenticity. And going back to, we talked at the beginning about, you know, knowing why you're applying for the company and having that, that knowledge of yourself and what it is that you want from the role and what your values are and just being able to carry that forward into the interview so you've got the confidence about who you are, um, you know, you're positive about the job, you want the job and just being able to embody that and take it all forward. Yeah, and, and you know, I'm not saying that that is an easy task because, you know, if you're 21 <laughs> or 22, to know who you are in a professional context and all of those things, you know, that takes decades and sometimes people never get there. You know, I work with people, you know, in their fifties who are still trying to, to work that out. So that's not an easy task. Um, and employers know that you are not the fully formed article. You know, they but what they're looking for is potential. They're looking for people who've got energy, intelligence, kind of a work ethic, and who, if they invest in, will be a really good performer for them. And that's what they're looking for. And, you know, and, and if you can show that you understand what the job is, and you really want to do it, um, you're more, you're three quarters of the way there. How should people talk about their specific skills within the interview itself? Should they be proactively trying to 
uh, insert them into each of the answers or waiting more for the more generic questions that they might might get asked? I think that's a really good question because, you know, you will get some good interviewers and you will get bad interviewers. Now, a good interviewer should hopefully get up, be able to kind of elicit all this information for you and you'll be able to, you know, if you're talking about what are your strongest skills, then your answer is going to be, you know, ones that are truly ones that you're good at but also that are relevant for the job, right? They, ma- they match their priorities. and. Then what you're doing is an example to prove that. Oh yes, well, for instance, you know, um, I do think I'm a, a, a good team player because you know, I worked in this project team to get this done. So, you know, you're you're putting examples in there. Having said that, if you don't get a good interviewer and you don't have the opportunity to say, I, I really want to tell them about this because it's very relevant for the job, and they don't ask about it then volunteer it. And you can just say, oh, and, you know, you might also be interested to know that actually I've got this experience. And so don't, don't let the interview go without you mentioning the things that you want to say. And, you know, sometimes people do say, oh, they didn't ask me about this and I really wanted to tell them about this. Well, actually, you can, you can just volunteer this. At the end, just say, I, you might also be interested in this piece of information. That's a really good point. And how can people make sure that they're not verging, having the confidence to talk about themselves and sell themselves, but without verging across the line into arrogance? I think arrogance is when it's unsubstantiated, actually, so it's like empty vows. I think as long as you are proving with examples that you've done what you said you've done, again, that's just factual. In my experience, most people, I'd say 99% of people undersell themselves. So the problem, everyone always worries about boasting and bragging, but actually they need to turn the dial up uh, most of the time. On occasion, and I would say that this is exceptional in my experience, uh, graduates who go over the top, um, I mean, I do remember working with one graduate who, you know, when I first saw their CV, I thought they were the CEO of their organisation. <laughs> it's a multi-billion pound organisation, um, not not a you know 23 year old intern. Um, but that was an exception. It, but isn't it interesting that so many people worry about boasting and being you know bragging when actually they should be worried about underselling themselves. That's that's a really interesting point. So you'd recommend even if you feel like you're you're boasting that you still need to crank it up a level. Yeah, you, you do. And right, this is a life skill. So this isn't just about getting your next job. This is the same skill that you will be using for uh, progression in your organisation. It's about your ability to talk positively about yourself. Actually. The, the, the kind of organisations are full of really hard-working people doing a good job. Who are the people that progress and get on? It's the people who are hard-working, but they also let other people know how hard they're working and that, what their achievements are. Um, whereas sometimes the people who just quietly get on with it can get a bit stuck and, and don't get noticed. So. The more that as a graduate you can develop the skill to be able to talk positively about yourself. And it, it is a, a practice thing. Um, and it is about people having, so that they've got permission to talk positively about themselves. It's okay. The more they can develop that, um, the, the more it's going to help them in their career. I think that's a brilliant point. And thinking back uh, through when I started on a, on a large graduate scheme, so... Everyone who joined the scheme was all, you know, everyone was very competent, everyone was very good, but it was the people who flew through the organisation upwards and onwards were the ones who, who promoted themselves well, who let people know they were doing good things, who sent, uh, got feedback from clients and just, you know, make sure it was, it was fed upwards to the, to the right people. And at the promotion process, you know, they were the people that, that were getting promoted quicker than everybody else. And there were some people who found that very difficult to, uh, difficult to handle because uh, they were maybe... They saw themselves doing a good job, and um, yeah, it was difficult to see these people who just flew past them. 
Yeah, you know, and and sometimes that's unfair because you know they may well get promotions when there were, might be other people who could do the job equally, if not better than them. But that is the reality, and I think if you can get to grips with that and acquire those skills and practice those and deploy them, that's going to be to your advantage. Definitely, like you said, it's a skill that will stick with you all throughout your career. Yeah, absolutely. Corinne, unfortunately, time is running away with us. So before we finish, let's move to the quickfire question round. Um, so which one book would you recommend to our listeners that they should read? Well, I remember when I was first starting um, my business uh, in 2003, and that was a really scary time, big career change. Um, and I found the Paul McKenna book, Change Your Life in Seven Days, incredibly helpful. Now, I know sometimes people think it's a, it's a bit cheesy, and I can see that he's been in the tabloids only, uh, only recently. Um, but I actually felt it was incredibly helpful. So I think anybody who's feeling a little bit wobbly, needs a bit of boost in terms of self-belief and anything to do with your career, uh, as that can be helpful, um, I think it's a really good book. Super. That's um, it's one I've seen. I've not actually read it, so you can. I'll have to get... And it's an audio book, so you read oh, okay. it. It's a bit of NLP programming going on. But I just thought, you know, it's a wobbly time. Sometimes that can be quite helpful. Oh, definitely. And what one website would you recommend? Well, of course, apart from the personal career management site, which has got <laughs> lots of resources on, on there. And um, I do think a uh, Guardian career site. It's really good. There's lots of really great articles on there. There's Q&A forums, a lot of interactivity. Some great stuff for graduates. Um, yeah, I, I think that's what we're looking at. That's an excellent tip. And all the links that we've discussed in the show will be found on uh, the show notes at uh, graduatejobpodcast.com, including, as Corinne mentioned, uh, the link to uh, personal career management, where you can find all the links to uh, Corinne's many articles across, uh, across the press, which I definitely recommend reading. And finally, Corinne, what one tip can listeners implement today to help them on their job search? Ask for advice, I think. It's because this is tricky stuff. Um, and actually other people can be really very very helpful to you so don't think you have to do it alone ask for advice and people are happy to help Corinne thank you very much for your time today before we finish what is the best way for people to to get in touch with you and your writing and your books yeah so if they go to um, uh, the personal career management site www.personalcareermanagement.com they can uh, email me via the site um, and happy, happy to, to talk to people there. Corinne, thank you very much for appearing on the Graduate Job Podcast. Pleasure. Thanks, James. My many thanks to Corinne Mills for coming on the show and sharing her insights. We covered a lot in those 26 minutes, and as always, a few things stood out for me. The first, and it's one that might require a slight change of mindset for some people, is that not only is it okay to blow your own trumpet, but it's required if you want to succeed. Because simply, nobody else is going to do it for you. You could be the best qualified person in the world, but if you don't shout about your skills and experience on your CV or in the interview, you're not going to get the job. As Corinne said, for 99% of people, the danger is underselling their skills, not overselling them. So go in there, be confident, and shout about what you have to offer. The second key point for me, and it's a point which we have covered in many episodes previously, is a need for personalization. In order to effectively sell yourself, you need to know which particular aspects to sell. And that comes from knowing what the employer is looking for. Now this isn't what you think or hope they're looking for, it's what they're looking for. One aspect of the job search process I spend a lot of time on when I'm coaching is what do they want to see in your application? That is a powerful question, as often people's answer is, well, this is my standard CV or application, it goes to everybody. And that is most definitely not the answer if you're looking for success. As Corinne said, do your research, go through the job spec and tick off each aspect one at a time. Look at the company's values, what sort of person they're looking for, and can you clearly illustrate that your CV or application now matches those requirements? If not, prepare to be disappointed. The final thing for me, and it follows on from the first tip, is being able to effectively sell yourself isn't a skill which ends when you get the job. It's a life skill which will stick with you wherever you take your career. If you make it a point of letting other people know about your successes at work, 
you'll find that you progress much quicker than your peers who might hide their light under a bushel. Another episode put to bed there, and only one more to go now to the big quarter century. If you enjoyed the episode today, drop Corinne a tweet and let her know at Corinne Mills on Twitter. If you want to digest everything we've discussed today in more detail, head over to the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash sell yourself, where you can find all the links and a full transcript. And whilst you're there, you can also sign up to the mailing list to receive a cool little ebook which contains the brilliant top tips that you can implement today from 20 of our previous guests. Some absolute pearls of wisdom in there. Do get in touch with us on Twitter at gradjobpodcast. And if you've enjoyed the show, please leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher Radio. Now I say it every week, but it's the best way, other than sharing us with your friends, to show appreciation for the podcast, and it does help massively in the rankings on iTunes. Also, if you're not subscribed already via iTunes or Stitcher Radio, you need to sort that out. It's the easiest way to get each episode delivered to you for free, to make sure you don't miss a thing. Join us next week, when I speak to author and CEO of Purple Cubed, Jane Sunley. I hope you enjoyed the episode today, but more importantly, I hope you use it and apply it. See you next week.